Andrew, uh, thanks so much for being on the second episode of Exit Strategy Podcast. Super excited to have a conversation with you. Um, I feel like you and I are both in the e-commerce space and we've never met, although I've met Jack before. Uh, so excited to meet you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, and so a little bit about your background. You were a, the co-founder and a, a partner at Atomic and the CEO of Hims and Hers right now. Is that right? That's right. Um, okay, looking forward to this conversation because I think that every, every company that I talk to today wants to be the new Atomic. Um, <laughs> and can you tell me first how you describe Atomic? Is it like, uh, is it an accelerator? Is it like an incubator? How do you describe Atomic? Yeah, so Atomic is, is something pretty special. It's, it's neither a venture fund, nor is it a, a studio model. Um, essentially, Atomic is a company whose sole purpose is to build other companies. So we have a group of 20 or 30 individuals there that are um, all operators and entrepreneurs, and we diligence and vet between 20 and 30 businesses per year uh, and end up spinning out and evaluating the ones that we see the highest potential in and then going and funding and, and founding those companies with other co-founders that we bring into the fold. So it's really a, it's a team of operators um, that, that have a phenomenal access of a uh, pool of capital and great LPs like Peter Thiel and Mark Andreessen. And we use that capital to build the companies that we have seen have the best promise and the most signal from all of our tests internally. Uh, okay. So Atomic tries to um, test out 20 to 30 different business ideas per year. One of those business ideas was Hims and Hers. Is that correct? That's right. And how much money does like Atomic uh, spend in order to test a business idea? So you've like Atomic has raised money independently of Hims and Hers and Hims and Hers has really raised money independently of Atomic. That's right. Um, how much money does uh, Atomic spend to, uh, to test a business idea? So traditionally we'll start with something like 50 to 75,000 to get a little okay. bit of signal. Um, and then it might expand up into a hundred or 200,000, but you're, you're talking about relatively small seed checks necessary for one or two individuals to build prototypes, get data, call people, try to sell things, try to understand product market fit, positioning, price points, offers, et cetera. Um, and, then, and then when we get that data, we're able to actually look at it relative to 10 or 15 other companies that are in that incubation process and look at metrics side by side to see where outliers exist. So for example, with Hims and Hers, um, you know, the, the crazy part about that company um, was we used about $50,000 to get that company started. And with 50,000, we built a prototype over the weekend. And this was in you know, 2016, a prototype over the weekend that would let men download a mobile app, answer questions about their health, and then sign up for a package relating to different types of medical conditions that they were worried about. Um, and that prototype, it was, it was called Club Room at the time. Uh, and that's because in, in my gym, there was an old deodorant bottle called Club Room. And I said, oh, okay, that seems like okay. a good test name. Let's run with that. So we, we, we literally got this thing up and running two or three people on a weekend. Um, and in the first five weeks of that prototype, we did a million in sales uh, signing up for, for the offer. Uh, and again, nothing was built yet. It was signing up for a wait list. They put in their credit card. Um, and then I would manually email them and say, hey, you've been added to the list. Like, you know, total, total early testing, right? Kind of zero to one phase. Um, but that, that cost just $50,000. And it was at that point that we were able to look back, look at the customers that had come in, look at their profiles, look at their willingness to pay, and decided that there was real demand to go and build that company. And so how much, uh, so you spent $50,000 to build a mobile app. How much, like, uh, called Club Room, how much of that is done internally versus externally? Like, are, are your operators sort of developing the apps um, and putting them on the app store, or do you do that externally? So all of that is internally. So we, um, we have and then a, you spend money on Facebook ads to try and get people to download the app and uh, yeah. try and sign up. That's right. Depending on, on the company, whether it's a consumer app, you might try uh, traditional distribution methods like an Instagram or Facebook or Google sure. or direct mail or radio or whatever it is. If it's a B2B company, it might be um, sales tests, like sales calls, automated calls, yeah. understanding price points and, and offerings. Um, but essentially that capital is, used to build the prototype and find what, what I like to call some type of proprietary distribution channel that gives us confidence we can scale this business successfully. Not only that 
we know how to build something that's amazing, but we know how to get it in front of people in an efficient manner that gives us confidence we can, we can grow this company in a unique way. And so aside from hims and hers, what are some of the other ideas that you guys have launched? Yeah, there's quite a few. So uh, a company, Bungalow, which is a, a, a co-living company um, based in the yeah. Presidio as well over there. They've raised uh, quite a lot of capital from uh, Kosla, Founders Fund, uh, a lot of big names. Um, Homebound, which is a construction company. It's helping families during um, natural disasters around the country rebuild and have that supply demand model actually be much more efficient so that people can build homes much quicker, much easier, much more on time, much more capital um, efficient. And, and that company has raised maybe 40 to 50 million from Google Ventures and Thrive Capital. Um, there's a company, uh, Terminal, which is actually a remote um, education um, company that brings together recruiting and engineering into one hub. So you can imagine this company going around the world, building amazing hubs for engineers to come learn and work with Silicon Valley startups. Uh, Hims, for example, we've been a client of this company for many years. Uh, most of our engineering team is scattered through Mexico and through Canada, and they all live in different terminal uh, offices. Um, so those are a few, a few of the, the most recent companies that have yeah. broken out and raised, you know, between maybe 40 or 50 million in the last and year. And can you give us an idea of like three companies that you you thought would break out and didn't like, you know, uh, what I really love about Bessemer uh, Ventures is yeah. that they have this uh, thing on their website where they have the anti portfolio and they're like, you know, we missed the opportunity to invest in Airbnb and FedEx seven times and Apple. I feel like all VC funds should do that. Like whenever I was trying to raise money, I was like, Bessemer should be the first company I go to because they're like humble about their uh, origins and That's nobody right. else is. That's right. um, what, if, what are a few of the companies that you guys tried to incubate and didn't work out? Particularly the guys who got past phase one, past the $50,000 and got into the $150,000. Yeah. You know, there, there's um, a lot of them, right? I think, and then that Bessemer page is, I think, one of my favorite pages on the internet, frankly. Yeah. Uh, I think it's incredible. Uh, you know, there was a sleep apnea company. We, were, we have family members that have suffered from sleep apnea. There's about 30 to 40 million people in the United States that have sleep apnea. And the process of getting diagnosed, tested, and actually getting the equipment for CPAP machines is, is excru excruciatingly painful and expensive. And so the idea was, could we make that easier for people to, to do diagnosis and treatment and actually get the equipment? Couldn't make that business work. Um, and that was a really unfortunate one that we tried. Um, there was a business in, in pet insurance. This is years ago. I was really passionate about this. Everyone loves their, their dogs. Willingness sure. to pay for it your animal is, is in many situations higher than willingness to pay for yourself or your partner. Uh, couldn't get the economics of the business to work. So and this was like pet them. life insurance or pet health insurance? Uh, a pet, uh, pet life actually was pet, it was pet, uh, health insurance. I'm sorry, not life insurance. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, there's been, there's been a lot of them and, and most of the ideas at hims and hers are really, uh, internal ideas, right? It's, it's things that, that us as partners are really passionate about. Uh, and really want to exist in the world. And so Hims and Hers was one that, that I was very passionate about wanting to exist. Uh, Terminal, which allows uh, you know, any company to hire dozens of incredibly talented engineers from anywhere in the world very quickly. That was something that us as founders has always, sure. we've always wanted. Um, and so we like building businesses that, that we you know, can really resonate with. And, and I think that's where um, you know, we've had a lot of success is just there's that instinct in building something you're passionate about. Uh, and then we're like, um, as these ideas sort of are born and grow up, how do you, uh, how do you staff them? So, you know, for hims and hers, it's easy. You're the co-founder uh, and a partner at Atomic, so it's simple. Uh, with Bungalow, with Terminal, do you hire internally to find CEOs or do you look externally? Yeah, so we, what we do is something called a founder in residence program. So at any given time at Atomic, uh, there might be five or 10 individuals that are uh, internal founders that are working with the partners and working with the operating teams to prototype and test ideas. And they are really the leaders taking charge of, of bringing those tests to market. And so with Bungalow, for example, uh, Andrew and Justin are the two co-founders of that company. Uh, they were founders in residence with us for many, many months looking into a vast range of ideas. And we prototyped 
many ideas as a group. Um, we saw incredible signal around the co-living space, the desire to live in a city, the desire to have a more affordable life, the desire to live with people in a community. Uh, and they were really excited about it and we were excited about it. And so we jointly decided to found that business together. Um, and so in almost all circumstances, the founders of those companies started as um, founder and residents operators internally helping us evaluate ideas and then they choose a path once they get that passion and that conviction for an idea. Uh, and so that happens and that happened with you uh, with hims and hers. Um, and then and then what is the next step? So you've got uh, conviction around it. Well I guess first you do Clubroom. This is this app. Is Clubroom uh, just available for when you're pitching Clubroom and running ads for it, are you running ads for like certain types of things? Are you saying, hey, we're going to provide you with, um, you know, the generic version of Propecia, we're going to provide you with the generic version of uh, Viagra, or is it one or the other, or is it all of them at this point? Yeah, when we were pitching Clubroom, it was, um, it was a range of all of those. So when we were, gotcha. we were exploring what conditions for men um, really resonated most at in an efficient um, yeah, at an efficient CAC worthy yeah. of building a business, right? And so at the end of the day, these companies really are successful when you can build a recurring engine, right? There's a willingness to pay, there's a margin structure, and there's a proprietary set of distribution channels that allows you to pour an amount of capital into that and grow the company. And so, uh, you know, we, we looked, looked at a, a range of different medical conditions that had different margin profiles, different medication offerings, uh, and then went to market and tested those to get a good sense of what men would be willing to pay for each of them. Uh, so you test price point right out of the gate as, as well. Price point, offering, yeah. um, the whole thing. And, and so after you've spent the $50,000 or $100,000 sort of proving the business model, uh, you raise, you, you got to raise money, right? You're going to need a team. You're going to need to need to build a much better app that like where you're not manually emailing customers. Uh, do you raise money from Atomic or do you go to VCs at that point? Yes. So, so at that point, um, it's a, it's a mix of both. So Atomic has a, a large fund that's able to contribute into rounds. Um, what I did, and I think what most of our founders have done is they, they bring in other great partners into the round so that you've get yeah. You know, even smarter people that are experts in different areas, depending on your business. And so for my company, when, when I decided to, to found this, um, we decided to partner with Kirsten Green at Forerunner and Josh Kushner at Thrive. Uh, the two of them are, you know, incredible human beings, some of the best investors I've ever worked with today, and still to this day are exceptionally valuable and involved in the business, even on a you know week to week basis. Um, but they were truly experts in how you revolutionize old industry with new behavior, new business models, new brands, right? And they've really, they've, they've proven that from, you know, Harry's and Warby to Dollar Shave Club and Jet and Glossier and Bonobos and the list goes on and on. Sure. Um, and so at that point, when we decided to build HIMS, we raised from those two funds and Atomic also participated in that round. And that was really our seed financing. And how much did you raise in that seed financing? Um, you know, don't quote me on this, but it's somewhere I, I want to say between five and six million. I, okay. I can't really sure. remember. Yeah, yeah. And what's the, what's been the total fundraise to date? And can you talk about valuation? I've certainly seen that you're a unicorn. It's certainly got to be nine figures that you've raised. How much have you raised? What's that valuation? Look like? Yeah, we, we've raised over 200 million to date. Um, uh, and, and yes, the, the last, the last public valuation was, was over a billion dollars. Um, uh, and, and so that's kind of where we're at, we're at today. Gotcha. And then can you talk a little bit of about structure, like um, I, I'm curious because you know when uh, when you're building a business, generally uh, um, you know the founder controls the entire business until they start raising money, and then VCs start owning a share of the yeah. business. And at some point, either the founder still has majority share or doesn't have majority share. But there's really like two parties: founders and VCs. Here, there's a third party where there's Atomic. So who sits on the board? Who controls the board? Um, like, wh what does that structure look like? Yeah. So the way we think about it, Atomic, it is, it is essentially that you're co-founding your company with Atomic. Atomic is a group of operators that are highly incentivized to make sure that all of the companies we found are wildly successful. And so there are a number of partners at Atomic. Um, each of those partners will take lead with different companies um, and with different founders and, and, and be essentially the operational lead for Atomic with that company. Um, and so the way you think about it is as, as you join Atomic, you're going to be co-founding your business with a huge group of individuals. Um, and this group of individuals from strategic finance, distribution, marketing, sales, strategy, accounting, legal, HR, 
are all available to you and, and not on a kind of as needed service basis, but truly as a part of your team. Um, and so it, it's a pretty incredible advantage that allows me as a founder or anybody else as a founder to focus on the one or two things that actually matters for your business, right? And that might be building the brand. It might be finding the distribution channel. It might be sourcing the product, um, but, but it but allows you to uh, co-found the business at scale. And so structurally, that's what the business looks like. You're co-founding it and you're splitting equity depending on the situation. And then when you raise external capital, we are all equally diluted by that external capital. And so who decides to raise external capital? Like, do you need the, like, let's say, um, you know, I was a member of a, I, I was a, you know, a residence member, uh, an entrepreneur in residence at, at Atomic. And I was like, okay, great. This business is working. We all sort of agree to that. I go out and pitch funds. Am I making the call? Is Atomic making the call? Or like, what's happening there? No, the, the, the CEO that, that gets put in place and is, is taking charge of that effort has complete autonomy to make the decision of, of who they want to work with, what partners, what VCs. Um, you know, at this point, Atomic and, and us as partners have, have worked with, you know, the vast majority of GPs at the funds in, in the Valley. And so we can give guidance yeah. based sure. on expertise or specialty or past experience with a certain fund or a certain set of individuals. But it is always that individual who finds that kind of personal connection with the board members and the new investors that they want to be bringing in. Gotcha. Okay. So it sounds like the CEO has a lot more autonomy. Um, and, and can you talk about who sits on the board of, uh, of hims and hers, or is that confidential? Uh, the, the, the board is confidential at this point, but it's fairly reflective of the major investors in the company. So just like any other um, uh, structured startup and board, your primary investors are the ones that are taking board seats for the company. Gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. I, I want to dig into hims and hers a little bit more. Um, and, and I think, look, we're, we're maybe where I can start is where I can, I can start by explaining what it does. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, since you're actually running the business. Perfect. Um, you know, uh, it's a men's wellness brand. And uh, well, Hims is a men's wellness brand. Hers is a women's well wellness right. brand. Um, and basically, you're trying to make um, medicine available that has been scientifically proven to do what it does without the headaches and inconvenience of having to walk into a doctor's office, get, you know, get a prescription and do a bunch of bullshit before you get your medicine. I think that's a, a good way to put it. Um, you know, the, the way I'd put it is that Hims and Hers is a a healthcare company that makes it easier for you to get access to experts and the medicine and treatments you need for a range of dozens of different conditions you're worried about. That's a great way. Uh, so, you know, you know, like um, when I was doing research about hims and hers, uh, I saw, I, I, you know, I read a bunch of other interviews that you've done. You said you did a million dollars in sales the first week that you launched the brand that you launched hims. Right. And that was the worst week you've ever had. That's right. Uh, that's absolutely bananas. Like, um, you know, in 2013, like uh, Casper, which at the time was certainly the DTC darling of the world, did a million dollars their first month. And everyone was like, how is that humanly possible? And you've like moved the bar much, much higher yeah. to do a million dollars in your first week. I'm sure there's a company little bit out there that. somewhere that's going to do a million in their first day in the next few years. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there is as well. And like, um, uh, you know, I hope it comes out of Atomic and I hope I'm an investor <laughs> in that company. I have no idea what it's going to be, but uh, I'm sure that the bar is moving right. up every day. Sir. Um, can you tell, uh, talk a little bit about how you achieved the million? Was the million dollars in sales the first week generally a result of you going to the guys who had signed up at Clubroom saying, hey, come buy this? Or was it something else? And more importantly, week two, you did another million dollars. Um, how did you get those customers in the door? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, you know, the, the way in which we did that, I think, reflecting on it was having a very solid understanding of the type of guy we were going to go after, the type of messaging that worked, the type of brand that resonated, um, and the type of offering that we knew they wanted to buy. And so, you know, while people say we did a million dollars in our first week, they think, okay, well, we launched. And all of a sudden, when we started learning, that first day when we started learning, people just came and started running towards us. Um, and I think that's where there's a big, big education gap. In fact, there was probably two and a half years before that um, when we were really understanding our person, 
right? We were getting customer insights. We were talking to men. We were asking them about how it made them feel to be losing their hair or to be struggling sexually or to be feeling like they didn't have energy or they had acne in their mid, mid 20s or late 30s. And that didn't seem right. Like really understanding who our person was. Um, and so there was, there was years of doing that research. And in particular, years of figuring out what is the brand that activates that customer, right? And the, some of the key insights were stigma is a huge problem, right? There was this sure. concept of men being too tough to take care of themselves and, and brushing it off. And so there was this whole kind of toxic masculinity that we had to crush as a brand to, to encourage and empower people to go and take care of themselves. And so that was a set of insights. Um, there was a whole telemedicine component, as you said, like, I'm the last person to want to go to the, like the doctors and, and I'll really only go unless I've, I've, I'm like bleeding from the head or I broke an arm or something. And so if I could make that easier from my phone, 90% of our orders take place on their, their mobile device, talk to, talk to a physician, click buttons, answer questions, take photos. And then, and then I get access to the things I needed. Like it's make it simple. Right. So there was these insights we knew needed to happen. And so, you know, while, while we had an incredible first week and I think it's an amazing sign of the success. I don't want to, you know, undervalue the fact that it was probably two years of work to understand the customer in order to launch on that day and say, we have a high degree of confidence what we're launching. People are going to love because we've been talking to them for a really long time. Definitely. I, I absolutely think uh, that, that's certainly worthy of being said. Um, you, you know, one of the other things I saw when I was doing research for this was that um, multiple branding agencies have taken credit for building uh, for building hymns. <laughs> That's right. Can you set the record straight? Who was the branding agency that you guys actually worked with? So we worked with a lot of branding agencies, to, to, be, to be totally honest. Um, and what we did was, and this was, I think, some of the, the secret sauce, because some of the insights coming out of this were you could build dozens of different types of brands. What we knew we Definitely. wanted to do was build a brand that um, could cross gender. We knew hymns and hers or men and women together was going to be critical because we had this idea of a future healthcare brand and that wasn't only men and it wasn't only women. And so we didn't want to build a brand that only segmented to men. We wanted to build a brand that was um, accepting of where you felt you were as a man. You could be young, old, straight, gay, black, white, doesn't matter, but it needed to be as modern and fresh and leaning into that, that um, flexibility that modern masculinity has. Um, sure. And so what we did was we actually put out um, a lot of agencies and they came back with concepts. And then from there, we filtered down to a couple agencies. And in particular, we worked with partners in Spade out in New York, which I think is one of the best branding agencies in the world. Um, and what we did with them was actually designed multiple brands. So we identified them as, as a great creative eye talent and strategic talent. And we actually designed five or six brands. Um, and saw how they felt. And we sat on them for weeks, literally weeks, different names. Yeah. Some of the names were Triple Point, uh, McCoy. We almost named the company McCoy. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's Admiral was one of them. Um, and, and so this process of, of finding out who we were um, really happened with Partners in Spade. And then what we did is um, we took a lot of that work and we brought in some expert teams like Jin Lane out of New York, um, our VP of design um, uh, is a guy named Daniel Kanger, who ran uh, the creative team at Jin Lane for a decade. He joined us recently a few months ago, and he's been working with us from the beginning. And we took that brand understanding from Partners in Spade, and we said, how do we now visualize this? How do we art direct it? How do we put it on sites, on mobile devices, and went from there? Um, and so, you know, the, the reality is, is that we had a lot of people giving us input, gotcha. and we had a lot of people designing different concepts. And then what we did internally at the end of the day is we art directed every single photo shoot. And by we, I mean me and uh, Hillary are, you know, a co-founder of mine yeah. and head of product right now. We were on the shoot. We were writing the copy. Um, we were owning that spirit of the brand so that it really was as pure to what we wanted to be as possible. Gotcha. Okay. So you've got branding coming from multiple agencies with sort of your curation and your um, vision being executed. You've got all this feedback that you've received from customers and two and a half years of studying who you, who you think is going to buy the product and what you think the barriers are to buying these products already. You launch and you have a million dollars in sales the first week. Um, 
You know, uh, one of the things I've heard you talk a lot about, and you mentioned this earlier uh, during our conversation as well, is a proprietary marketing, uh, proprietary marketing strategy. Yep which is you don't want to be subject to the whims of auction-based uh, marketing platforms like Facebook and right. Instagram. Uh, so uh, first, I, I want to understand, are you able to advertise on Facebook and Instagram or are you not able to? Yes. I'm always curious, like, you know, you are able to. Yes. Okay. I gotcha. Um, and then, you, you know, those, you know, um, I, I built an e-commerce business that was largely based off of uh, auction-based advertising and um, found it to be successful, but certainly... Um, you know, a roller coaster ride. Uh, what are the like? Tell me some of the marketing mecha- like marketing things that you do that like you know. Certainly, everyone has seen your um, you know your television ads, and everyone has seen your out of home ads. Everyone knows that you advertise on top of journals and you know in the train station at New York. What are some more unique things that you guys do? And uh, tell me how this sort of t- tell me how you're buying this type of advertising. Like you know, advertising in, in trains in New York, anyone can do. Advertising in urinals and stadiums, a lot of people haven't done. Like, are you right. calling up these stadiums, or is there a third party that you are working with? Right. Um, so the the way we think about this is we want to create inventory, not buy inventory. And so our entire marketing team and our entire marketing strategy goes into every room they walk into, and every store, and every gym, and every locker room, and, and every restaurant. And their eyes are looking, every bar, and their eyes are looking around for literally things we could own, right? That we could have a relationship with. And, and the criteria is, where is your target customer, man or woman? And, and it's different for different medical conditions, right? Maybe ED is something you want to talk about when you're in a urinal, but hair loss is something you want to talk about when you're in the gym locker room and you're looking in the mirror and you're realizing that, yeah. you know, you're kind of thinning it top. Um, but something like birth control maybe is appropriate in a completely different setting for women and, and acne for women is appropriate in a completely other environment. And so this is how our marketing team thinks about it. And, and the reason we think about this is because for better or worse, the auction based marketing channels are effective and they're efficient. Um, and for that reason, companies become dependent on them. And in building companies in the last decade at Atomic, I've seen a lot of companies that become too dependent on them. For sure. And inevitably, of course. what happens is, is the uh, saturation rates, as you want to continue to grow and pump more dollars into those channels, the costs go up, uh, the curves get worse, the retention of the customer gets worse, and all of a sudden, you're really stuck in this limbo. And so the strategy for us is we want to have as little of our capital being deployed in free market auction-based platforms. And we want to be owning proprietary relationships with other partners. And so there is no third party agency, right? There's no like black sure. market um, for buying a urinal. You have to go to the SF giants and say, hey, I love the walls and the urinals. And, and I don't think you're yeah. making any money off of it. What if we paid you X? So have you um, gone and, to like the guys who own Equinox, like related properties and been like, hey, we want to advertise in the locker room at Equinox? I mean, I would imagine they'd say no, but is that something that you guys have done in the past? I've, I've talked to the executive team at Equinox many times. Um, yeah, gotcha. You know, there, there are a lot of different opportunities when you start opening your mind. And so, yeah. uh, you know, for example, for, uh, um, I mean, it's all types of stuff. We were sitting in a bar one night talking about it and I was like tearing, I've got this nerve nervous habit of tearing the bar coasters right yeah. into like pieces and i look and it's like a budweiser bar coaster I'm like well somebody on our team goes why don't we just buy it why don't we do that you know we're yeah. sitting there right there so now if you're in a new york bar or san francisco bar in a good chunk of the bars the coasters are hymns right with hilarious statements and branded and and the amount of text messages i get from friends and family saying hey this is incredible. I would have never yeah. imagined we'd do that. It just came from the creativity that we've empowered our team to have of, hey, go find opportunities. Sure. And do you have to work with bars individually to do that? Or do you, can you do that at scale with a certain like coaster manufacturer? Yeah. You know, you, you try to do both yeah. uh, and you end up having to do both. Yeah. Um, at a certain point, you get efficiencies and you find individuals that own multiple bars or yeah. they have a network of bars or maybe it's the alcohol distributor or something, right? Um, but it But it is it is coming from this first place, just kind of like open creativity of finding opportunities. Yeah. You know, what's crazy is during this conversation, I've realized that you're the first startup that is not subject to the immediate needs of driving revenue today. Like in order to build marketing channels like um, urinals at SF Giants, are you having multiple conversations with the executive team at related properties? 
you need to be able to be, you have to be comfortable with the idea that the revenue you generate from conversations you have today will not come from months. Right. And at most startups, uh, they don't have that type of like timeline. That's right. Uh, you know, you have to be like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a conversation about generating revenue in the next few days. And um, how is that possible? Is it because your investors are more long-term focused? Is it because you already have such a large moat uh, in terms of revenue and in terms of capital? Or like, where, like, why is it that you are singularly not focused on revenue in the next 30 days? I think it's a great question. Um, you know, when I started the company, and, and I think in part because I've, I've built an, uh, a number of companies before, the, the opportunity for, <clears throat> for him and hers, in my mind, is to build a multi-generational public company. Like this is a large opportunity. You're talking about probably 80% of healthcare moving to digital telemedicine in the next five years or so. That's a huge, huge opportunity. Maybe one of the biggest left in, in that I'm aware of, right? You've got sure. retail, you've got commerce, you've got real estate, transportation, and then you've got healthcare. Um, and it hasn't been touched yet. And so, you know, from the beginning, that was the vision. And when I went and pitched this to Kirsten and Josh, I made it very clear, that's what I'm going for. I have no desire for this company to be acquired, you know, at a couple hundred million, and that's a great exit. And then boom, I'm sitting on a beach no desire. Like this is one of those ones you really just put your head down and go for it. And in order to do that, you have to invest in the brand and investing in the brand. What that actually means is losing money. Like you have to lose a certain amount of money for the purpose of building equity based value and, and relationships and communications with your customers. It is always cheaper to buy an advertisement on Facebook, right? Or to buy sure. or Google Dad, um, at low volume. Um, but you can only build so much from a true depth of relationship with customers and the variation of customers by doing those types of channels. And so what, what I made very clear to the investors was we're going to allocate a certain amount of capital to these types of initiatives where every single month we're going to be testing, we're going to be learning, we're going to be making brand investments. And then for the other chunk of capital, which is still the majority chunk of capital, it's going to be exceptionally efficient and we're going to hold ourselves accountable to real numbers and making money back. Um, and they signed up for that. And to this day, we still have those parameters in place where there's an have efficiency. Have the percentages bucket. changed? Have the percentages changed or are they pretty? Uh, you know, the percentages today? have been roughly the same. Um, the, the numbers have gone. goes to like, the majority goes to non-brand or like more like, I don't want to call it direct response, but we're like, I'm looking for revenue in the short term versus building brand. That's right. The, 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 the larger bucket. Wow. First, I'm impressed by your marketing budget then because like uh, I see, like, you know, I know how much, uh, you know, ads in the New York City subway cost. Uh, and those are brand advertisements, right? And like, that is a lot of money already. Um, and, and so really impressed by the marketing budget. How do you work on attribution when it comes to like the idea that you have these uh, chunks that are happening today? and chunks that are brand value. Like, we're, like, you know, your test, you know, I think that's really hard. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. At Native, we were constantly trying to drive people uh, into stores at Target right. and at Walmart. Right. And so we tried digital ads and we're like, you know, do we see a lift in this certain zip code if we bombard these people with ads? And, and, and so we ran those types, of, uh, those types of tests. How do you know if like, uh, you know, if, if you're owning coasters and you're owning the San Francisco Giants urinals, What's working and what's not? Yeah. So the only way you do this is through a set of control tests, right? So depending on the brand campaign, maybe you're talking about TV. <clears throat> you, you identify the zip codes that those TV commercials went live. You look at spike attribution analysis of the minute it went live and, and the historical trends before that minute and the six minutes after that. Uh, and then look at the zip code, you know, two blocks away and see if you got that same that same delta, yeah. right? So TV makes sense, but be, SF Giants is much harder. Are you looking SF at, Giants is there a is spike actually, during games? SF Giants is the same thing, right? So again, 90% of purchases are taking place on mobile. Um, look at the day games, look at the times of those games, look at the traffic during those games and understand, right? And so you can do spike-based analysis yeah. based on zip in that type of world. Um, and then the also thing you can do is, is more traditional, and this is never accurate to a, a, a perfect degree, but at least it's directionally helpful, is post-purchase and pre-purchase surveys, right? Yeah, like, how did sure. you hear about us? I heard about you from seeing it on an advertisement somewhere. Which advertisement? Boom. And then you can get an, an idea, at least proportionally, where that, that 
uh, uncategorized traffic is coming from, right? Because because traffic that's coming directly to your homepage, everyone will say, hey, that's free traffic, that's organic. Now, the vast majority of it's not organic. You pay for it somewhere. You just have to figure out where you bought it from. Yeah. And uh, can you tell me a little bit about the marketing channels that you spend money on today? So uh, a big bucket is still sort of direct response and a big bucket is brand. What are the top three? Um, you know, there really are no top three channels. It's, uh, it's buckets. And then within the buckets are dozens of little buckets. Okay. Um, and so you've got the traditional digital channels that you can think of. Um, top two right, that, um, I, I, Traditional digital is one bucket, right? That's like all the Facebooks and Googles and Instagrams and TikToks and Snapchats and uh, dating apps and, and yeah, affiliate sure. partnerships and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's an audio bucket, right? You've got all types of audio. People hear podcast ads, they hear streaming ads, they hear um, radio talk hosts, things of that sort, podcasts. Um, there's TV buckets, right? Um, and then there's very non-traditional buckets that uh, like urinals or planes flying over Coachella uh, or coasters sitting at bars or things like that. Um, Is that the order of buckets where you spend money digital? than no. audio than tv no okay what look in audio is podcast the number one bucket um there are the word podcast there, there's like five okay, let me change the question then in, in digital is facebook is slash instagram the number one bucket uh it's the largest within digital okay um what, what's but, another one but, that's larger within digital but, but within digital you also have dating apps you have affiliate networks um uh, you've got uh, partnerships with education sites, right? I mean, there's, I mean, there are, uh, again, the, the traditional things like Facebook, and, and I'm not going to tell you all the things we do because your listeners need to literally think about what their product does and what their customers need and then think, okay, where are they and how do I talk to them? And so we do that for our, our customers all the time. Um, that doesn't mean that Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all those are not tested, but they're, they're not really the majority. They're not the majority for you. Uh, the, the traditional digital spend is not the majority okay. of spend for you. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with the idea that like, um, you know, uh, you have to speak to your customers where they are and what works for one business won't work for another yeah. business. I wish there was really a silver bullet. Out. I wish somebody sure. had told me this list of silver bullets, but unfortunately it, you just have to really understand who your person is and then go think about where they're spending their time. Couldn't agree more with that. Um, okay, so you did $1 million in sales the first week. C can you talk about like uh, revenue or growth uh, year over year? Um, where are you at? And, and um, from a uh, perspective of uh, understanding that you're spending a good portion of your marketing dollars on non-direct response ads, but on more brand equity ads, are you profitable or are you not? Uh, today, we are not profitable. Uh, we are relatively close. Uh, so I would say, you know, in the, in the coming years, when we want to pull that switch, we are definitely capable of pulling that switch, which is uh, a great position to be in. Uh, currently, we reinvest essentially all of those profits back into the engine uh, sure, sure. and grow into new conditions. Um, and so we recently launched uh, a behavioral health, or I'm sorry, a primary care category that has everything from like, a, you know, uh, asthma and allergies and sinus infections and UTIs, et cetera. Um, and so continue to expand on that front. Um, uh, from a kind of public numbers, I think what's public is we've done, we did over 100 million in sales last year. Um, uh, we did about over a million telemedicine visits uh, in the last year or year and a half uh, on the platform. So that's actually a patient talking with a physician and getting a treatment evaluation. Um, is that, is that like an asynchronous or synchronous communication? It, it totally depends on the condition and the state. Um, so it's both. Um, and it also depends on what the patient prefers. Um, and then the company's only been live for two years, right? And so you can think of growth rates. If we did 100, you know, 100 million in sales last year, it was a pretty fast growth rate from the year before. Um, yeah, uh, certainly was uh, incredible growth. I, I don't think anyone is uh, questioning growth uh, at Hims and Hers. I, I think it's pretty phenomenal. What per, can you talk a little bit about uh, categories that are leading that growth and also whether it's Hims or Hers that are leading that growth? Yeah, so, so the, the historical categories, which are Hims, which have been around um, you know, a year to a year and a half longer than Hers, are still the majority of the business, right, given the time. Yeah. Um, the majority of things that we are launching today 
uh, and that we plan to be launching this year. There's maybe, I think, 50 launches in 2020 um, that, that we're rolling out. Each launch is a different medical condition that a patient can get evaluated for on the platform. Um, the vast majority of those are hims and hers together. Um, so they're, they're non-gender specific treatments. Um, and these are things like, you know, the majority of things we care about, right? People worry about sleep, they worry sure. about anxiety, they worry about um, their, their health, their immunity, cholesterol, right? like the like normal human stuff. And so they're, they're non-gender specific. And so uh, there's a pretty big investment from our side to, being, to, to bring those offerings essentially out to market together with hims and hers in a unified way. Got it. And, and so hims is the majority of the business. Can you talk a little bit about categories as it go? Like, I, I've looked at some of your categories. I think it's ED, uh, hair loss, and then I think it's also cold sores. Is that right? Um, th those are a few of them. Some of the big ones, you, you, you've got acne and anti-aging. Yeah. You then have supplements for sleep, immunity, heart health. Um, uh, and then you've got uh, the, the sexual health stuff, which is you know STDs and uh, uh, erectile dysfunction as well. And for the anti-aging stuff, is it like retinol? Like, is it retinols that you guys are prescribing, or is it over-the-counter stuff? Uh, it's all. So all those categories are prescription categories. So we are actually compounding uh, prescription tretinoin in high concentrations that are custom formulas for your skin type, your age, the type yeah. of acne you're experiencing, or the type of anti-aging that you're, you're struggling with, um, and getting those shipped to you overnight. And so do you guys own a pharmacy at this point? Like, I, I imagine there's a lot of regulatory tailwinds that are, aim that are going in your direction. Patents are expiring, like Viagra. States are opening up their medicine, uh, telemedicine laws. Um, do you guys own a pharmacy, or are you working with a third-party pharmacy? Uh, both. Both. So we work with a number of, of uh, pharmacy partners in the provider network. Um, and then we also have uh, publicly announced a, a very large, I think it's a 400,000 square foot pharmacy operation of fulfillment center in um, Ohio that will be going live in the next few months. And uh, how did you like, um, I guess, were there any, you know, obstacles when you guys were growing the regulatory side of things? You know, um, like, let, let me give you an example. With Uber and Airbnb, those guys were like, look, we're going to do this. We're going to run into a bunch of regulatory hurdles. And when we run into those regulatory hurdles, we're going to jump. We're going to figure out ways around them or over them. Cool. Um, and, and sometimes that's right. And sometimes that's not certainly a little bit harder with medicine. And I don't mean to like say that you got, I, I, th I think what you guys are doing is phenomenal and genuinely providing a real service to consumers who are either too embarrassed or can't afford to go to the doctor. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm really like, um, I'm genuinely thankful that you guys exist in the world. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, were there regulatory hurdles or were you like, uh, were you the, uh, on the Uber Airbnb side of the spectrum or were you on the uh, Procter & Gamble side of the spectrum? Um, probably neither, right? We're, we're okay. somewhere in the middle. Uh, we have a, a, you know, a very uh, veteran executive team in these areas in particular. Uh, you know, our chief legal officer ran the telemedicine practice at Jones Day for a, dec a decade. Um, our head of regulatory, our SVP of regulatory affairs and, and legislation and public policy uh, ran these initiatives at Lyft and at Square um, and at Zenefits, right? And has been doing it for, for over a decade. Um, and so our, our comms executives ran it at Lyft as well. Um, and so when you look at maybe Lyft versus Uber and PG and or PNG, they were, they were kind of in the middle. Um, and I think that's maybe where we fall from a risk tolerance yeah. standpoint, meaning we are always pushing on behalf of our customers, but we are going to the regulators and we're going to the medical boards uh, in, in sit down conversations, explaining why we think this is right, as opposed to breaking the law and then having the conversation afterwards. So I think we have been uh, very careful, um, you know, to, to be as, um, as safe as possible to make sure that we are the gold standard for telemedicine because this market of telemedicine is growing and changing and, and, and uh, adapting so quickly. And so we've kind of put it on ourselves and I feel like have, uh, that's been a really important part of our strategy to be the, the talking point to these medical boards and explaining the benefits of all of the things you said. And so in order to do that, you have to keep the credibility of following the rules and following the laws and, and, and actually help change the laws. And we've done that in a number of states. We've actually had laws changed in the last few months and in the last couple of years. Uh, and I would expect that would continue to happen as these legislators understand the benefits of telemedicine. And how, like, you, you know, um, to that effect, 
you know, you're talking about being a gold standard of telemedicine. How do you think about your competitors? Um, you know, you're, it's, some of your competitors are well-funded, some of them less funded. Um, is it, you know, if people are all prescribing um, generic Viagra or generic Propecia, it's sort of a race to the bottom to that effect. Are you, is your, is your thought process, hey, I want to create, um, you know, proprietary medicines, sort of like the anti-aging, which are customized to people to build mm -hmm. a moat? Or how, how do you think about um, separating yourself from your competitors? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's really interesting. At Hims and Hers, um, the vast majority of what people buy are treatment solutions that are fairly comprehensive. And so um, they might include, like you said, a generic pharmaceutical, like a finasteride or like a sildenafil or like a Valtrex type medication. Um, but what they also include are shampoos and conditioners and moisturizers and custom topical solutions and, and vitamins and, and that offering. And, and we see that across the board when customers come to us. They don't come to us because they're looking for cheap drugs. Um, you know, those options have always existed. You've had online pharmacies, Canadian pharmacies um, exist for years. What we see from our customers is they're in their teens and 20s and 30s, and they're learning about these conditions for the first time. And they're coming because they want to get educated by a physician and they want a comprehensive treatment that's custom and tailored to them. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the, um, the commoditization of the pharmaceuticals should happen, right? Because they are generics yeah. and should be affordable and they should be cheap. And the more that companies exist in the space, the better for all customers. And I think we will continue to be able to differentiate by offering real solutions. And a lot of times the solutions are flexibility and options and customized care. Uh, and as part of that might include one of these medicines. Does that push back against like the scientific background of the, you know, of the proven medicines? So like if you're using um, Propecia, which, you know, the FDA has said helps you keep your, your hair, um, and you're also selling, you know, if you're selling like Rogaine, I understand it. Uh, you know, they're also FDA regulated. But like, are, are there like FDA approved shampoos, for instance, that, uh, pr uh, you know, keep, that will allow you to keep your hair? Yeah, you know, there's always that spectrum, right? And I think one of the things that, that, that I believe is that, and this, is, this comes from a, uh, kind of a deep understanding of our customer. Our, our customer, when they think about their health, it includes pharmaceutical medicines on one side, and it yeah. could include food meditation on the other yeah. side and sure. they're both healthcare like they truly are both healthcare right and so what i believe we need to offer as a modern platform is flexibility saying hey if you're worried about sleep there's a lot of things we could do there's cognitive behavioral therapy if you haven't tried that it's incredibly effective there's things that are over the counter and safe that you can use on occasion, like a melatonin, chamomile, L-theanine blend. Um, there's Chinese medicine that has been that proven to be effective, and then there's also pharmaceuticals, right? There sure. are uh, there are there are side effects. There are pros and cons to all of these, um, and I think what what we've seen is that customers in our demographic that are coming into their 20s and 30s and 40s they want that flexibility. And depending on the severity of what they're experiencing and what they've tried in the past, they might have different spectrums for different conditions. And so we as a platform want to make sure we are always standing by the statement that everything on the platform has the best medical clinical experience it can have. That doesn't necessarily mean it's always FDA approved. Sure. Um, but when you talk to a doctor about supplements, nine out of 10 are gonna say, if you're going to try something, that's the one to try. Yeah. Um, and that's really what we're going to always lean on. That's fair. I, I appreciate that sort of clarity. Um, really quick questions about uh, understanding your team size, because I know we're uh, running up against some time. Uh, how large is the team of doctors and nurses that you have on your staff that sort of prescribe medication? Uh, we have uh, over 300 physicians and providers on the platform. And how quickly are they writing prescriptions? Is there like a metric where you're like, uh, on average, a doctor can write a prescription, uh, like on average doctors are writing prescriptions every seven minutes? It's not, it's not a metric we, we choose at all. The provider networks essentially have complete independence for how they treat patients. We are the platform that's connecting the patient to that external provider network. Um, and so they get paid on essentially on an hourly basis to see as many patients as they're able to see. What's the rate of people that they prescribe uh, medicines to? Uh, it totally depends on the medical condition. Um, you know, so there are safe medications when you're talking about like a tretinoin for acne, yeah. where sure. you might see, you know, 90% of those patients coming through the door qualify for that medication and maybe 10% based on other medications they're on do not. 
Um, and then there's more serious medications like, um, let's say, a, a birth control that has a blood clot potential. Depending on the patient, you might have a 50 or 60% prescribed rate. Um, and so it really depends on the physician's understanding of that patient. And the patient, before they get to that point, goes through a full comp like consultation with that physician. So they're talking about their medical history, the drugs they're on, any side effects they've experienced in the past, et cetera. So the, the range is quite quite large depending on the medicine. Uh, gotcha. Understood. Very, like, uh, makes a lot of sense. Two questions, actually. Two more questions, actually. One is, how has COVID-19 sort of affected the business? Has it been great for, because no one wants to go to the doctor? Uh, and I mean, great with the understanding that this is a catastrophe for the, a catastrophe for the world? Or has it been, like, how is COVID, you know, it certainly it affects team morale by virtue of the fact that all of you guys aren't able to go to the same office sure. every day. How is it affecting the business? Sure. Um, you know, I think what I've experienced most from the COVID-19 tragedy is that our team is energized like I've never seen it before. It is a, a full-on wartime mentality within within the digital office at the moment, within Slack, like I've never yeah. seen anybody on our team act. And so, you know, we are in a position, I think, like many, to actually change our priorities to help the situation. You've got a whole population of people staying at home. Those people at home are still struggling with asthma and bug bites and UTIs and yeast infections and acne and, and sinus infections, et cetera, yeah. right? Um, but it is more important than ever for them to stay at home, both for the safety of themselves, their family, and their community, but also to give as much relief as we possibly can to the healthcare system, right? And not going in for non-life critical illnesses. Um, and so what I've seen is our team be energized to think about first principles, what can we use our assets for? We have physicians that are experts, we have telemedicine platforms, we have a pharmacy fulfillment, a brand. How do we get things to customers that can help them and help the, the health providers that are on the front lines? And so you saw that we, we launched the, the primary care offering yeah. uh, a week or two ago that opens up a huge telemedicine platform. Um, and, and I hope in the, in the coming weeks and months, we'll be able to continue to expand that to more things. Um, because I think from a business standpoint, that's what I've seen more than anything is our team is trying to reprioritize in order to help the current situation. And so has there been an acceleration in people's adoption of telemedicine in the last you know, month? I, I think across the board, there has been an acceleration, right? When you uh, have people at home and unable yeah. to go into a physician's office, telemedicine is, is the perfect yeah. solution. Yeah. Um, and so I think across the board, people that are working in digital environments, whether that's teleeducation, telemedicine, televideo conferencing, right, like this, um, those businesses are, are absolutely seeing customers come to them um, in exchange for the in-person opportunities. Gotcha. Okay, my final question is about the state of the direct-to-consumer industry. Um, you know, I read this quote by Gary Vaynerchuk where he said, 98% of direct-to-consumer businesses are out of business right now and just don't know it. Um, basically meaning that they're addicted to the Facebooks and Pinterest of the world. Their unit economics will never work. Um, there's been a come to Jesus moment with the failure of brandless and with, you know, um, the headwinds around outdoor voices. Um, where, where's the industry uh, five years from now? Like, or it, like one, is Gary Vaynerchuk right? And where's the industry five years from now? You know, I think there are, there are aspects of what Gary said that are right. Um, there have been a number of companies and, and a large swell of companies in the last couple of years that have been deploying capital into open auction-based platforms like we talked about that have completely upside down economics. And it's not because they're building their brand and, and, and investing strategically, but because literally the economics don't make sense, right? But they're trying to figure them out. And every founder is always working their butt off to try to make them work. And so, um, you know, in an environment of the last few years, when you've had the capital and the investors willing to fund that experimentation, it's beautiful. In an environment like today, where I think it's going to be exceptionally hard to raise capital, I think flat rounds will be the next two to three X rounds, you know, because it'll be so hard to get. Um, I, think, I think he's right in that a lot of those companies are going to struggle to, to get profitable and they're going to struggle to raise capital. Um, and so I, I do think that is a reality. I think the market has been able to finance the exploration for a number of years. And we're now getting to a point where that willingness to finance the R&D is no longer there. Um, and so companies need to be exceptionally efficient at 
finding their profitable cohorts, finding their profitable customers and channels and focusing on those. Because in a situation like we have right now with the markets and with COVID-19, survival is growth. Like if you survive the next year and two, you have grown substantially. And I think as a founder, that's the only thing I'm thinking about and the, the thing that I would recommend all other founders to be thinking about. Uh, and what are the things that you've done to, in order to like, um, in order to focus on that? So if you're, if you're focused on survival, or maintaining or like ensuring that you get through this crisis or have you pulled back on marketing have you has there been hiring freezes or are you like look um full you know full steam ahead damn the torpedoes you know so we we're in a very um privileged position in that we have uh you know a material balance sheet of capital yeah. in the bank that gives us the flexibility to get to a point where we're profitable and so, um, you know, we're not dependent on raising outside capital, which is phenomenal, but we did immediately institute hiring freezes, comp freezes, and then we communicated this to the team saying, hey, we need to evaluate the impact of what's happening to the business. We have no idea what it'll be. It might be positive, it might be terrible, it might be completely trivial. But until then, let's all just stay calm and let's stay as we are and learn and look at the data to make decisions. And so we're in that process right now of evaluating data in real time as it's coming in day over day and week over week. And until then, we're not making any big strategic moves until we can get a good sense of what's gonna happen. Got it. Uh, fantastic, really appreciate the time, Andrew. Like, uh, love chatting with you, love being able to see a direct-to-consumer business that has a long-term fo focus instead of a short-term one. Not sure I've ever seen that in the history of my <laughs> life before. And, um, you know, uh, congratulations, a lot of props to you, uh, not only for all the success at Atomic, but really Hims and Hers is the gold standard of direct-to-consumer businesses today. Uh, I hope you're incredibly proud of what you've accomplished. Like, um, you know, 20 years from now, uh, you might be looking back on your life and being like, this is going to be the first line of my obituary. And, um, you know, uh, I, I hope you feel that pride today and don't only feel it 20 years from now. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Great. Thanks for the time. Really appreciate it. Awesome.